nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company, and America's gas industry, developing new sources of gas energy and ways to use gas more efficiently for more than 160 million people across America. It's been called the most awful hollow on the surface of the planet, the lowest place on Earth, the Dead Sea. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and now we continue our naturalist journey through the Holy Land, ending our voyage along the shores of the Dead Sea, near the site where the Bible tells us the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for their evil ways. But along the way, we'll visit some welcome oases, nourished by sweet water springs, where birds and other wildlife live in small patches of Eden. We explore this land of violent contrast in our film, Sweetwater, Bitter Sea. There is a great wilderness in Judea, a place of desolation where the bare faces of the rocks bake all day in the blinding heat of the sun where there's no hint of green or stirring of life. At the edge of the Judean mountains, the desert plunges 1,200 feet below the level of the Mediterranean and meets the water of the deep blue but dead sea. Waters so saturated with salt that they are poison to living things. But somehow, between the wilderness and the salt sea and defying all their hostility, there is life. Perhaps there is no region of our earth where nature and history have more cruelly conspired, where so tragic a drama has obtained so awful a theater, wrote an historian of this place. The history of the Dead Sea opens with Sodom and Gomorrah and may be said to close with the massacre of Masada. This is the lowest place on the earth's surface. Those mountaintops are barely above sea level. It's a place of heat, salt, asphalt, and sulfur. But it supports large and powerful animals. When the mature male Nubian ibex in full breeding colors come together to settle the matter of who deserves a mate, each tends to pick on someone his own size. A younger male is eager to join in the contest, but he won't be considered a serious contender for several years yet. Although sexually mature by his second year, a male ibex must wait until he reaches the height of his powers at about age six before he will have a chance to capture a harem of his own. Every part of the body of an ibex was once believed to have a medicinal value. For this reason, as well as for their meat, they were hunted almost to extinction. Israel has protected them, and now these hills echo again to the sound of their battles.
Israel is part of the only land bridge between Africa and the continents of Europe and Asia. The Rift Valley runs the full length of the country, and it's the migration route of perhaps a million birds of prey, which spend the winter in Africa and leave it in the spring to head north for their nesting sites. Eagles, buzzard hawks, and kites have long, broad wings to support their heavy bodies. And they travel most economically by soaring on thermals. These supporting currents of warm air form when the desert heat causes the air to expand and rise. Funneled by the cliffs of the Rift Valley, thermals are the escalators of the bird world. They ride in their thousands on the shoulder of the wind one of the most thrilling aerial displays in the world. To cross this barren and lifeless terrain, the flesh-eating birds must stock up well and put on surplus fat before leaving their winter quarters. The chances of picking up a meal on the way are slim, but if they see an opportunity, they take it. Any carcass acts like a magnet, attracting hungry migrants. Here, a spotted eagle from the deep forests of northern Russia joins a gathering of steppe eagles from the treeless plains in the southern USSR, a strange company brought together in an alien land by a common need. With a full crop, she'll soon be ready to resume her long journey north. There are resident raptors, like the griffin vulture, at one time a common sight over the desert. But now, with only 69 breeding pairs left, one to be enjoyed as a rarity. Vultures like to nest high. They prefer the seclusion and security of the sheer cliff face. And as they launch themselves to forage every morning, they already have lift and elevation without exertion. Breeding is a lengthy process for vultures. Both parents will invest the better part of a year in raising their chick. 
It can take up to two months to build a nest and then another 55 days for incubation. The pair will raise only one chick, which will be dependent on its parents for another hundred days. The young vulture needs to be sheltered from the fierce heat of the sun. When vultures soar, they are very slow moving. It was this ability to remain aloft without apparent effort that made the vulture a holy bird to the Egyptians and Assyrians, the goddess of the upper kingdom. But when they fold their wings and dive, they come down at up to a hundred miles an hour. At the last minute, the feathered legs come forward as air brakes to slow the descent and bring the men precisely on target. An arid and desolate landscape, and yet behind these cliffs lies the greatest underground reservoir of water on Earth. Billions of gallons from centuries of winter floods filtered through the porous limestone, filling massive underground caverns. Miraculously, in a few places, water bursts through the rocks and brings the desert to life. And to discover this oasis after crossing the burning hills is to understand why, for the ancient tribes, the images of the Creator were so often those of streams of living water. En Gedi, the spring of the wild goat. This same waterfall was flowing at this spot when the young David surprised Saul and spared his life. This the greatest oasis on the western shores of the Dead Sea is a place of life. The comparatively lush environment at Engedi supports animals that have no special adaptations to desert life. This praying mantis is the same species you might find in your own garden. But species which evolved in the burning wasteland also find the oasis a comfortable home. This bizarre mantis thrives in the driest parts of the Negev, places that would shrivel its smaller cousin. But the abundance of food here makes life easier. The mantis will strike at anything that moves, but ants are not on the menu. They exude formic acid, which makes them distasteful. Even frogs find a life of plenty here, for these clear pools never dry up. They provide a diversity of food and habitat to a great variety of plants and animals, many of which are more commonly found in Africa. Some are found nowhere else in the world. But this whole wondrous community is only a few feet from the desert. The Sinai Agama lizard doesn't need any permanent source of fresh water and makes his home in the rocky places of the desert. The males are territorial and display themselves on a prominent rock. The blue head shows that this one is ready to breed. Curiously, as the day heats up, the color intensifies until it covers his shoulders and forelegs as well. The giant millipede also prefers a rocky desert terrain. Its seven-inch length may be alarming, but unlike its poisonous cousin, the centipede, it's harmless. Can be told from its dangerous look-alike by counting the number of legs per body segment. Centipedes have one, while millipedes have two. It's active mostly at night scavenging for plant material and spends the heat of the day in a shaded recess beneath the rock. Its burrow also protects it from predators, like the white-crowned black wheat ear. Only mature males sport the white cap that gives this wheat ear its name.
This species of wheat ear is commonly found in Africa, and this is the northern limit of its range. It's a year-round resident. It spends most of its time on the ground, bobbing and chasing for flies. Flies are quite common near the shore of the Dead Sea, so the wheat ear chooses this unlikely place to breed. On the bare heights of the Judean mountains each morning, as the rock faces begin to heat up, the fan-tailed ravens gather from all parts of the nearby desert. They come together and then fly down to the sweet waters of Engedi. They visit here each day to bathe and drink. The fantail ravens are scavengers, and they've learned that here at En Gedi, there are rich pickings. It was when the prophet Elijah dwelt by the brook Cherith that according to the Bible, the ravens, in obedience to the word of the Lord, brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. The dense blackness of their feathers seems strange for an animal that spends so much of its waking hours in the direct rays of the sun. But when cleaned and preened, the feathers provide superb insulation not to keep the body heat in, but to keep the sun's heat out. The temperature of a raven's skin has been discovered to be 50 degrees less than that on the surface of its plumage. The waters of En Gedi draw a rich variety of birds. Tristram's grackle. The African bulbul. and Spanish sparrows. Wherever in this place you find a pile of rocks, you find hyraxes. They may look like oversized guinea pigs, but surprisingly, they're more closely related to the elephant. Each morning, the dominant male in a colony cautiously inspects the feeding area before the rest of the group awakes. They have a low metabolism and warm up in the early morning by lying along the rocks. It's said that hyraxes can eat anything. They have sharp incisors and can even make a meal of the oleander and the apple of Sodom, which are deadly poisonous to anything else. The book of Proverbs tells us hyraxes are a feeble folk, yet they make their houses among the rocks. And in this place, the rocks have rich sources of food and shelter at their base. They are as much at home among the Phragmites reeds and the Sisyphus branches as among the rocks. They are agile climbers, and can stretch out to the very tips of the branches to obtain fresh young leaves. Their paws are especially adapted for grasping and manipulating vegetation. On the front, they have suction pads, and on the back feet, they have three toes and a special grooming claw. Most hyraxes are wary of the slightest disturbance, and an alarm call sends them scurrying for shelter. But some are reluctant to be disturbed, especially when experimenting with an unfamiliar snack.
Near the feeding areas, there's always a group of young males hanging around and sparring with each other, practicing for more serious combat in later life. Hyraxes have a scent gland in the back of their necks and they use it to mark the rocks around their home. A few days after birth, Hyraxes are independent and active. From around two weeks old, the young can be left by their mothers in a sort of kindergarten where they are cared for and sometimes disciplined by an adult female. Like its cousin, the elephant, the hyrax has nipples between the front legs and also at the back. Birds abound at En Gedi. The Arabian babbler forages mainly on the ground for plants, caterpillars, and fallen fruit. Here it's found a date. It cleans the sticky residue from its bill by scraping it on a rock. Tristram's grackle took its name from a distinguished Parson naturalist, Canon Tristram, who spent nearly a year here in 1863, studying the flora and fauna and discovering new species, including this one, as part of his investigation into the natural history of the Bible. The calls of Tristram's grackles are one of the most distinctive features of En Gedi. The sand partridge can survive extreme desert conditions. This ability led naturalists to claim that they have nasal salt glands to help excrete the unusually high intake of salt in their diet and it was thought they could exist without water by finding enough succulent seeds in the desert. Both claims have turned out to be false. They do need to drink water during the summer, and like other desert dwellers, they have the ability to concentrate the urine to get rid of salts. They're shy and wary, and when David was pursued by King Saul, he described himself as like a partridge being hunted in the mountains. The black start is another bird found only in the desert. It originated in Africa and spread from there up the Rift Valley as far north as the Sea of Galilee. The female chooses a hole in the rocks for a nest and the male decorates the entrance with small stones. The bulbul is another bird that is spread here from Africa. 
It nests in the tamarisk trees. The female searches the bacatus bush for its berries which are often the only source of water in drier parts of the desert. But sometimes it seems that even in this fierce heat, with temperatures as high as 100 degrees in the shade, the chicks aren't really thirsty. It may look as though she's suffocating them, but by settling on the nest and fluffing out her feathers, she helps keep the youngsters cool. The young fledglings hang around the neighborhood of the nest for several weeks, waiting to be fed, although they're quite capable of flight and even of foraging for themselves. There is one species of sunbird endemic to this land, the Palestine sunbird, which builds a pear-shaped nest at the very end of a branch, out of the reach of snakes. Both parents are involved in the feeding. Although they live mainly on nectar, the young fledglings need a protein boost, and so they get a supplement of insects. Arabian babblers occasionally lose their tails, perhaps to a caracal or desert lynx, which can leap six feet and pluck them from the air. With tails, they're beautifully balanced to forage among the slender branches. These birds live in family clans, each within its own territory. Perhaps because breeding territories in these oases are scarce, yearlings remain within their parents' territory and help them to raise this year's brood. Once they've fledged, their parents will no longer be coaxed into bringing them food, but their older siblings continue feeding them until they're able to provide for themselves. Ancient Engedi, celebrated for its palms and its balsam, was a stronghold that could support an army. From it, a rough way was hewn through the rocks and over the mountains to Bethlehem and Jerusalem. But it's a wild and difficult road that was rarely used by travelers. It was left to the ibex, who were at home there. As the birds make their nest, said the psalmist, the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats. And the ibex is the wild goat of the Bible. It manages to eke out a living among the barren rocks as Tristram's grackle ekes out a living on the ibex. When King Saul took 3,000 men out of Israel and went to seek David upon the rocks of the wild goats, it was to this place they came. Twice a day, the ibex make the descent down to the springs of Engedi. They find water, shade, and nourishment here.
The ibex's skill at balancing on the sheer cliffs is put to good use when food is just out of reach. It's a lush, comfortable existence close to the oasis, but the Nubian ibex is used to scraping out a living from the desert and can scratch about for harsher fare. And there's still enough sustenance among these dry rocks for the hyrax. The females also have a hierarchy, but settle who's boss less violently than the males. This is the undisputed leader of the Ibex of Engedi. His dominance has been established in a series of fights before the rutting season. His harem has been selected and kept away from all other males. The rut is beginning. Once a band of females has been claimed by a male, he guards them jealously. This young female is just coming into season, but she's not yet ready to accept the attentions of the male, and it seems she doesn't know which way to turn. The pressure is on. The mating cycle begins when a male scents a female in estrus and responds by making what's called the flamen gesture. This curious expression helps him determine the female's state of sexual readiness from her scent. When a male approaches a female, it's with tongue out and horns well back to show that he's not aggressive. Sometimes the female seems more interested in food. But eventually his persistence is rewarded. These activities are carried out discreetly and were rarely seen by humans. They were a mystery to the ancient tribes of Israel. 
Knowest thou the time, God asks of Job, when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? In fact, the rut here happens in October, and the young are born in March, when the winter rains have brought a flush of new vegetation to feed them. During their first spring, when the young are learning their unsteady way among the rocks, they have only their mothers to teach them. The males have been so exhausted by the rutting season, in which mating takes precedence over food, that many die, worn out, after what's been called their one happy summer. The young are very vulnerable at this time to wolves and leopards which live in these mountains, but they stay close to mother. They're well camouflaged against the rocks. Only the black tails of their mothers stand out as a sign for the young to follow. The harsh conditions of the hills around En Gedi, which make life difficult for the animals, must have been even harder on the people who came to settle here, especially a people who included ritual ablution among the essentials of everyday life. To eat or pray without washing was a sign of impurity for these desert dwellers, and yet they came here and lived in these caves. It was in the depths of this one that the first Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered 40 years ago. Manuscripts of Bible texts dating back 2,000 years were hidden here for safekeeping by the Jewish community of Qumran. That same period saw another settlement on these dead shores become a byword for great heroism and terrible tragedy. Atop a limestone mesa looming hundreds of feet above the barren waste, King Herod built Masada, a mighty citadel. Its name means fort in Hebrew, and Herod's three-tiered castle still towers above the ruins. The path up to the gates was narrow, winding precariously along the wind-eroded cliffs. Masada was believed to be impregnable, and it very nearly was. In the end, it fell but only after the conquering Roman armies built a huge ramp rising 300 feet from the desert floor. For two years, a community of about a thousand men, women, and children withstood a siege on this desiccated plateau. But the Roman victory was an empty one. Unwilling to accept the yoke of foreign rule, all the inhabitants of the fortress perished in a mass suicide. The waters of this desert sea are as lifeless as the ruins on its shores. The Dead Sea is a huge marine lake occupying the lowest open area on Earth. Its waters contain almost 25% salt and other minerals. And they are sluggish, oily, and heavy. The foam and spray of the Dead Sea stings but does not refresh. The waves have a unique effect on all the objects along the shoreline. Because the droplets have a large surface area, they evaporate rapidly in the intense heat, leaving deposits of minerals that build up into thick coats of salt along the rock faces. Where spray drips from a cave roof, stalactites form. And living branches are killed and then preserved by the salt. The shoreline of the Dead Sea advances and retires with the centuries. Today, its minerals are being exploited by both Israel and Jordan. At the present rate of usage, the Dead Sea will be dry in 400 years. Around the shores are tamarisk trees, and on the branches are the weaver ants, the only insects to farm livestock. They live on the honeydew secretions of the scale insects which feed on the tamarisk sap. It's a sweet and nutritious substance, which it's been claimed was the original manna sent to feed the children of Israel in the wilderness. Even today, it's gathered by the Bedouin who collect quantities of honeydew in the early morning before the ants begin their labors. 
The ants milk the insects by titillating them with rapid touches from their antennae. They also take sweet excretions from the honey cicada, which turns its abdomen in response to the massaging and obliges. By exchanging saliva, the ants communicate the need to gather more honeydew. The weaver ants are careful of their benefactors. They build shelters which act like cattle sheds, protecting them from predators and the sun's rays. They weave together the leaves and fibers of these shelters by using the silk spun by their own larvae, hauled out of the nest for the job. When they have completed their duties, the exhausted larval spinners are returned to the nest, where they're fed by the ants until they have replenished their silk reservoirs. In a very few places along the west coast of the Dead Sea, there are, incredibly, pools where the level of water is high enough and the salinity at a modest enough level to support a permanent population of fish. These pools on the slopes below the monastery of Qumran are filled by springs emerging from the Judean mountains. They may have been a source of water and food for the sect which lived here. The pools are rare. This one at Infeshka is unique in the richness of its population. The fish, mainly tilapia, belong to the cichlid family, which occur in many freshwater lakes along the length of the Rift Valley, even as far away as Lake Victoria in East Africa. They're related to the fish of the Sea of Galilee, the fish which broke the nets of Peter and which fed the 5,000. They were so dense that in the time of Canon Tristram, he wrote that great shoals of them covered an acre or more of the surface. Tilapia are a very adaptable species and can feed on the reeds. They originated in Africa and now flourish throughout the Far East and America where they've been introduced. They're said to eat like elephants and breed like rabbits, and they themselves are a rich source of food. They may be too successful, they're out competing and endangering the native fish over much of their new range. A possible relic from the time when this area was on the bed of the ancient Tethys Sea is the crab, now adapted to life in these sweetwater pools. Many species of crab can tolerate either very brackish or fresh water but they must return to salt water to breed. Although the salty Dead Sea is only a few yards away, its poisoned waters would instantly kill this true freshwater crab. It completes its entire life cycle here in the pools of Infeshka. The killifish can live in saltier water and even survive in small pools where the temperature can fluctuate as much as 35 degrees between day and night. Few fish can live in such a range of temperatures. The male displays to the female. And chases off a rival. Because of their salt tolerance, these killifish can live closer to the lethal waters of the Dead Sea than any other inhabitants of these pools.
On the surface of these waters, insect populations flourish and are a welcome source of food for migrating birds that stop by. Rafts of flies congregate and feed on the rich algal growth. From the dawn of time, this land has been a meeting place, a place of pilgrimage for peoples of different faiths. The same meeting of travelers occurs in the world of birds. Each spring and autumn, migrating birds come here to replenish their energy on their long flights to and from Africa. The citrine wagtail from the tundras and wet moors of Eastern Europe. The algal mats are havens for all sorts of aquatic insects, which hide in them from the predators below. But predators from above find them easy pickings, like this red shank on its way to Scandinavia to breed. This gray wagtail has a more modest migration route. It only travels from the northern to the southern coasts of the Mediterranean. Balin's Crake, a shy marsh dweller from Europe's bogs and fens, finds welcome cover in these reeds. A reed warbler, which may breed in Sweden, feels very much at home here as well. The rarely seen jungle cat pauses at the edge of cover. Its Hebrew name means swamp cat and it feeds on the fish in the pools of Enfeshka. As the level of the sea rises and falls, shore plants compete to colonize the available land. The Phragmites reed is usually able to win over the largest space because it can send out long runners right down to the edge of the receding water. But where these bitter waves can reach, no life is possible. There is no hint of green. The Dead Sea. In Israel, it's called, as it was in the Bible, the Sea of Salt. And this is the Mountain of Salt, Mount Sidom, possibly the site of the City of Salt, of Sodom and Gomorrah, the place where Lot's wife was changed to a pillar of salt. So strongly does the atmosphere of death hang about this shore that the mystical vision of Ezekiel could picture no more powerful illustration of the regeneration of the earth than that these barren waters should be peopled by living things. The salt not only coats existing objects, it creates its own in thousands of crystalline shapes of accumulated table salt, gypsum, and a darker aragonite and manganese. And there are larger aggregations of minerals which look like coral atolls, washed by the waves that over the centuries build them up and destroy them. As evening falls, the earth cools, and under the cover of darkness, large predators walk abroad.
the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, but here prefer carrion. But foxes give way to the ruling scavenger, the striped hyena. Hyenas declare their territorial boundaries by scent marking with their special anal pouch. The striped hyena always forages alone. Unlike its relatives on the African plains, it does not hunt, but relies almost entirely on scavenging for protein. But it will eat almost anything. The fruit of the Sisyphus tree is a favorite food. Hyenas, like dogs, are attracted to a powerful odor, and they will roll in it to make it their own. Foxes not only tackle large carcasses, they will turn over stones in search of the smallest invertebrates. Even the poisonous ones, like the centipede or scorpion. As the dawn comes, bringing light to these lifeless waters, the creatures of the night take to their lairs before the shadows have gone. There is a special magic in the dawn at this place, for the sun both creates and destroys. Without its light, the plants could not survive, and yet, says the Bible, the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower falleth. The sun created the desert, the waste and howling wilderness, out of which the children of Israel survived the great exodus and the massacre of Masada. For the desert not only destroys, it strengthens those who can survive it. <laughs>